talking about innovation, I used to say to my team, if you're not meaningful, unique, you better be cheap. Uh, and this, is, uh, this makes very um, uh, visible and uh, shows the importance of innovation, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Open innovation across the value chain is um, a kind of tautology because um, if you're not thinking about the, across the whole value chain, you cannot be open in innovation. And I like what uh, Charles said in his introduction. It's not only about cooperating with external partners and consumers and so on. You have to start with cooperation within the company and within your team. And sometimes this is the biggest challenge for being innovative and being open innovative. What do I mean by value chain? Um, uh, of course, you have to integrate uh, your suppliers, for instance, uh, raw material suppliers or packaging companies, but also external know-how so know sources like universities, like consultants, uh, and so on. Uh, you have to cover materials and technologies since, uh, of course, these components make up your products in the end. Then you have to think about compounding, about production, because you have to be innovative uh, there again uh, to save value. And uh, concerning distribution and trade, you have to integrate your retailing partners, your pharmacies, and work together with them to be innovative. And last but not least, and of utmost importance, and we heard a lot about it yesterday, you have to talk and to listen to your consumers. So uh, this is my agenda for the presentation. I'm talking about open innovation by integrating consumers, uh, open innovation by integrating external partners like suppliers uh, and corporation partners, and open innovation at the point of sale and the partners who are involved in, the, in, se in um, selling products. But uh, I will start with the innovation process and the key factor innovation culture, so getting an open innovation culture within the company. But in the beginning, for those who are not so familiar with Bayersdorf, uh, let me uh, give you a short glimpse uh, on Bayersdorf, since Bayersdorf is not known as a name, but most people only know the brands. So uh, the most important brand for Bayersdorf is Nivea. I guess uh, all of you know it. It's the leading skincare brand in the world. Um, but we have other global brands. Uh, the other one is uh, Userin, which is uh, prominent in the pharmacy class of trade, and La Prairie, uh, which is our selective channel uh, global brand. But we also have some local uh, brands of, or with regional importance. For instance, uh, eight times four, which is market leader in the Deo segment in Japan, or Florena, a natural cosmetics brand in the German-speaking part of Europe, um, or Hansa Plast, or a famous uh, Plaster brand. Uh, a little um, view on the history of Bayersdorf. It all started 100, uh, nearly 100. Um, 30 years ago in 1882, and uh, Bayersdorf was founded by a pharmacist who invented uh, some plaster technologies. And this is very important to underline. Our company was invented on a technological idea and non, not on a marketing idea. It was technology who set the ignition for uh, inventing uh, all these brands. Uh, Userine came in with the um, with the discovery of the emulsifier lanolin alcohol. Nivea came in 1911. We just uh, celebrated our 100th anniversary this year, uh, and there were some acquisitions later on. Uh, again, to show the importance of the brand Nivea for Bayersdorf, these are the market positions in the markets here on this slide shown in Europe. But of course, we uh, have it for the rest of the world. We uh, divided it into the uh, segments of cosmetics, and we 
uh, count the number one, two, and three market positions. And uh, today uh, we have 166 of top one positions in the markets with Nivea, and we are working on uh, even improving it. Now I come to the innovation process and to the uh, topic of my presentation. Just two slides on this. Um, everybody of you, I think, has a, a gate process in innovation. This is uh, nothing uh, unique. Uh, what is important for me to explain is that in the different uh, phases of the uh, gates and of the uh, phases between, you have to work completely different in completely different management styles. Uh, so in the de discovery phase, before you get to gate one and, and you try to get real products in the shelf, uh, you have to work very creative, sometimes chaotic, uh, to manage all the ideas, all the influences and all the partners. It's very important not to rule everything, so don't forget this picture, you need some chaos. And later on, we call it freezing zone, of course, every, everything uh, has to follow some uh, strict rules. Um, this is uh, what happens in discovery management before uh, gate one. So, of course, we relate to the company strategy and the brand priorities, but we take in consumer needs, uh, we do thorough trend analysis, uh, we melt it, uh, with uh, results from science and from technology. Uh, and from these two uh, components, we cre create innovation pipelines. And for the guidance of the R&D people, we set uh, R&D search fields. And out of these uh, search fields, uh, discovery products emerge, and they will fuse then in the discussion uh, with the marketing people uh, to get uh, concrete product ideas to be launched. So the key factor in all this is innovation culture. Um, forget about strategies, forget about brand strategies. If you don't have the right culture, you won't get it on the street. Uh, so it's very important to manage uh, open innovation culture within the company. It all starts with knowledge management. Um, all of you know in your daily business life, uh, you get over flooded with information. Uh, and for instance, uh, in the life science field, uh, the, the amount of knowledge doubles every five years. So you can imagine that those poor scientists work in R&D uh, they, get, uh, they get drunk by information. So you have to find a way how to manage it. Uh, obviously, this is not the right uh, management. Of course, we introduced a lot of databases and so on, but um, this is important, you need it, but it won't help you to manage real communication. So my, uh, my take home message here is, bring the people together, let them talk, and don't tell them that they have to look into their databases every day, every morning. Let them talk. Um, the other thing, uh, especially if you talk about not invented here the drones and things like this, uh, you have to create a um, uh, culture of trust. Uh, and we uh, help and enhance this trust by having, for instance, um, company internal fairs where, for instance, R&D people show their projects to marketing people, to sales people, uh, share their vision and, of course, ask for feedback regularly. Then it is very important to acknowledge performance. You can see here our head of research, Horst Wenk, uh, talking on an international press conference of uh, Nivea Visage, our uh, face care brand. And it is very important to get the uh, researchers which did the discovery work, to get them uh, into talking about the successes. Uh, it's not a good um, 
signal uh, if you talk to your research boss, okay, well done, good job, go back into your lab and we manage the product and we manage the success. You have to let them participate. And uh, last but not least, uh, have fun together. Uh, we have regular sports events uh, in our group. Um, another thing is we detected that some of our uh, team members are musicians playing in bands. And so uh, we had a big concert where they could bring all their bands in and all the uh, people uh, at the headquarters in R&D uh, could listen to these bands and it was a big fun. Uh, and you can really feel in the weeks after such events, uh, the working together is um, easier. So uh, these um, soft facts help a lot. Um, it is also important to not let get distance, distances too big. We are living all in a, a global business environment and we have to travel a lot and you telephone and you have internet conferences. But the best thing to get people together is to let them look into their faces. Uh, so what we did, um, we have uh, short distances at our headquarters in Hamburg. For instance, the maximum distance uh, from R&D people uh, is 200 meters. Talking to international marketing, a very, very important interface, of course. It's only 200 meters reaching these people within this uh, complex building. And uh, our packaging colleagues, our patent department, very important innovation partners, are only 500 meters away. And we invest a lot into it. For instance, you can see here a bridge which we, which we put between those two buildings. Of course, you can go outside and walk around. It will take you five minutes more. But we decided to put this bridge between the buildings uh, with uh, 70 meters. It's the longest free hanging bridge in Hamburg. Uh, Hamburg has more than 2,200 bridges. So this was very a heavy investment. And we had to convince our supervisory board to put this money on the table. But it paid back a lot, I can assure you. Um, then um, you see here the walk uh, to the headquarters where patents uh, and packaging and our board are sitting. And we tunneled residential buildings uh, here and invested also a lot. We had to convince the city of Hamburg also again to make distances very short. So this is my message. Let people talk together. And if you save minutes, it will help a lot. Uh, you also have to build up uh, know-how and uh, open networks. So we invest a lot in getting people on board when we hired them for our company, for our uh, R&D group. So um, every time when we get 10 to 15 people new together, we arrange a big uh, seminar course. Uh, it uh, runs over eight months with 30 lectures and guided tours and includes not only R&D, but also supply chain, intellectual property, marketing. We regularly have somebody from the board talking to the new R&D people working at the bench in the lab. Uh, and this is a very good uh, measurement to bring uh, and to meld this group of 15 people together and to get them linked to the rest of the organization. A uh, heavy investment because a lot of people have to prepare these seminars, top management people, sometimes they don't like it, but we force them to do because it is very good to get people integrated and create an open innovation atmosphere. Um, <coughs> talking about uh, yeah, distances, of course. Uh, we have to manage our international uh, R&D sites, which is not always easy, and it is and remains a challenge, I think, for most of you. Uh, but again, uh, if you have slow and uh, short distances, uh, this is the best you can do. Now I'm coming to um, open innovation by integrating consumers. 
Um, we have a worldwide consumer insight program, which is uh, managed by my marketing colleagues. So they uh, conduct regular workshops. They announced uh, responsible persons to collect consumer insights. And all these consumer insights are uh, sent to the uh, headquarters. And we work with them very regularly and heavily. And uh, we also invested in uh, consumer and shopper understanding. Uh, so we have regular consumer visits and so-called shopper safaris where we send people from our management teams uh, in the bathrooms uh, and to consumers' homes and also together with uh, shoppers buying their products. For instance, here you can see a market in uh, Kenya where we walked around with sh um, shoppers. Uh, we trained 1,200 uh, 1, employees to get a better understanding how to collect insights, how to talk to consumers. And very important um, as a sign uh, to the organization, our top management regularly participates. For instance, if our CEO travels to China, of course he will spend one day uh, at uh, some consumers' homes and talk to housewives and inspect their bathrooms and interview them. So uh, yesterday, uh, Michael Bartel already talked about netnography. Uh, we use this tool um, very heavily and very regularly. This is the uh, uh, example you have seen yesterday. We learned a lot about uh, tanning uh, by this and got inspired for new product development by uh, listening to all these consumers in the web community. Uh, yes, and I only can rec recommend uh, to, uh, to listen to the consumers by this way, observing them without directly interviewing them because as, uh, as long as you talk to a consumer and to interview him or you pay him for something, he will tell you something but not always the truth. If you observe, if you listen, you will somehow hear the truth. Um, another thing is much more directly in our uh, test center premises. Uh, we uh, have more than 300 consumers every day testing our products and our newest prototype ideas. Uh, and so we get the consumers directly involved uh, into our discovery products, projects. And it's very important to get them in-house, although it's somehow an, an artificial atmosphere for the consumers. Of course, we have these bathrooms, and of course, we interviewed them before. What is the most normal bathroom? And we build it exactly like, like that. But of course, they know it's artificial. But it's important to get our scientists, engineers, directly into contact with the consumers. They have to see them. They have to feel them. Uh, uh, to get uh, the real, um, yeah, the real way of um, of integrating this uh, knowledge into the uh, products. So uh, we have these observation rooms and the bathrooms, and what you can see here is a lady taking a shower. Of course, they are volunteers. Uh, we tell them before you will get filmed by a camera. Um, and afterwards, we, um, we uh, talk to them. We watch together with the consumers the film we have taken and ask them, why did you do that? And why, uh, why did you shower so long? And why uh, did you rinse off your hair four minutes? And uh, we learn a lot of interesting things. For instance, <coughs> ladies with very long hair, they are really annoyed by rinsing off shampoos, it takes five, six minutes, and they tell us, it took me 10 minutes. And we tell them, no, this was, was not 10 minutes. Watch, it was only three minutes. But this shows you how annoyed they are. And now we know that we have to work on it. Another thing is, um, we call it online lab. We have discussion groups uh, just uh, in the neighborhood of the lab. 
And for instance, we give a fragrance product to the uh, discussion group and ask them, uh, how do you like the fragrance? And they say, okay, no, it's too fresh, it's too heavy. Then we go uh, in the direct neighborhood, in the lab, we change the fragrance, we come back, and we do it several times. And so you get a good, uh, qu although qualitative, market test within, let's say, two hours. Normally, for such a product, you need weeks, you need months. You have to arrange market tests uh, with agencies and so on. And sometimes uh, we have good solutions within hours. So this is accelerating innovation. Coming now <coughs> to uh, open innovation by integrating external partners. Um, at first, it's important to mention that we somehow have to attract partners. Of course, we can go out and tell them, here is Bayersdorf, uh, here is Nivea, we make uh, sales of 6 billion euro every year, so come on and work with us. But we learned that this is not enough. We have to somehow be a magnet for them and have, have to attract them. And especially if you talk about researchers, for instance, universities, scientific consultants, we have to convince them that we are state of the art in science. And then they will come uh, and work with, with us. And because their benefit is not only that they are getting paid by us, that, but also that they will learn something from us, learning something in science. So we help them with our uh, advanced equipment to better understand the biology of the skin. And they, uh, the other way around, give us uh, more than they would have given us only if we paid them. So uh, there are several ways of how we collaborate uh, with uh, especially uh, raw material suppliers. And these are uh, the different ways I'm going to show you. Project House, uh, we call an um, initiative where we have open marketplaces or symposiums. Uh, we only do this with very privileged uh, external partners because it takes a lot of work to prepare these workshops. Uh, and this is uh, very often uh, a spark for further innovation work and for finding ideas for projects which we can conduct together with our partners. The incubation lab is a collaboration between Biasoft and external partners at the bench. So we get scientists from our suppliers in our house, let them work with our scientists for weeks at the bench, um, and send our scientists uh, the other way around in the labs of the raw material supplier. In our seminars, uh, we give uh, some of our partners the opportunity to come in and teach uh, our technical people to learn about their technologies. And Pearl Finder is our web, web platform. I'm going to talk about it later. So here, um, um, another example of how we cooperate. We have uh, two fragrance houses as partners working in our premises. So they got uh, offices in uh, our labs. Uh, they have defined projects. And what we do is uh, commonly evaluate fragrances with them. Um, and of course, we have to take care that there's no direct uh, competition between those two, because they are sitting in the same uh, office area and they see them er themselves every morning. And we had to break some, um, yeah, some thoughts within our company uh, if this is a good idea because some people in R&D said we can't let them in. Uh, think about all the secrets we have, uh, but we learned uh, if we manage it properly, for instance, uh, these uh, fragrance house partners, they cannot look into our raw material prices, but uh, there is, uh, apart from this, a very open communication with our teams. Uh, incubation lab, um, this is an example where we um, had a uh, cooperation partner, a big raw material supplier, 
working for a few weeks in our labs. Uh, and what came out uh, of this um, working together was our uh, invisible touch deo. You already heard about it yesterday. We had a netnography running on this project, but netnography was getting uh, consumer insights, but we also had to develop technology, of course. And this was only possible uh, in this very, very close uh, cooperation in the incubation lab with our partner. Uh, another anecdote I want to tell you about uh, this project. We asked some people uh, in our uh, premises and in our organization to send us t-shirts with yellow stains uh, in the arm. Um, because we wanted to learn uh, about the stains and we worked together with the textile institute and tried to find out how we can get away these yellow stains. Within two days, we got more than 300 t-shirts and we had to stop the uh, initiative immediately. We uh, sent a message in our intranet and tell, told the people, don't send any more t-shirts because we get drunken by t-shirts. Um, but this showed again uh, and confirmed the findings from netnography, uh, how big um, this is an, uh, a topic for the consumers and uh, how heavy the problem is. And this also explains the success of the product la launch now. Um, the success uh, factors of the incubation lab, uh, let me um, show it here. Unrestricted utilization of technology and know-how. Um, this is said easily, but you have to convince your people that they have to tell, tell more than they are used to tell to external partners. Uh, transparency of decision processes and criteria. Um, it helps a lot, uh, these incubation labs, for the external partners to understand why we pick a technology and why we don't pick a technology. So it's a lot of transparency. And also for us, it's a good learning uh, how our external partners tick and how they sell their technologies and how, they, how deep their knowledge is. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, it's not only sharing knowledge, it really uh, accelerates uh, decisions and accelerates projects. So quicker de decisions on both sides of the table. Um, a success factor also is uh, top management commitment for this because you can talk and talk and talk to your people. Um, the easiest way to convince them is that everybody is on board. And here you can see on this picture our CEO, Thomas Quaas, and our head of R&D, Klaus-Peter Wittern, together uh, with the top management of one of our uh, raw material supplier cooperation partners. Uh, they spent a day together also in the lab. Um, and we interviewed them. We made uh, films and pictures. We put this picture into our intranet and told to all the people in organization we are working very closely together with this partner. Our partner did the same in his organization and this, this made things very easy and speeded up the whole thing. Um, now I'm coming to a different topic, technology scouting, uh, which is also uh, a topic I think in most of your companies. Of course, we only uh, don't uh, look into the cosmetic pot, but we look into uh, pharmacy and medicine, uh, into medical devices, into the photo industry, where we learn a lot about, for instance, uh, UV filter technology. And uh, you see here colors and dispersions, which is a topic very close to emulsion technology. <coughs> And how do we manage uh, technology scouting? Um, there are two ways. Uh, there's full-time and part-time scouting. Beiersdorf does both, but both of them have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Coming to full-time uh, technology scouting, so you have one person, uh, and the only task of this person is to traveling around, looking around in the net, talking to everybody in the outside world and getting some ideas in. Um, 
the plus for this way of working is if you have people with a broad long time experience and a special qualification if they are very curious, it's perfect for them. But uh, the disadvantages are sometimes they are overflowed. In the medium term, they lose their practical operational basis, though uh, they are just flying around, but uh, someday uh, they lose the network within the company. Um, and sometimes they are in competi competition with the line organization. Part-time technology scouting we also practice. There you have a direct link, of course, in the line organization, so you get ideas much easier into the organization. Um, and uh, another advantage is that somebody who, let's say, is working for 10 years on emulsifiers, Sometimes these people get a little bit like this and they get bored and you can enrich their job if you tell them 10% of your time you can do what you want but just get ideas in. Um, sometimes this may also lead to a, a loss of focus on the core job and of course we have to manage this uh, very uh, accurately and thoroughly. Um, last topic um, of getting uh, linked to the outside world is our web platform Pearl Finder. This uh, has gone on air in uh, January 2011. Why did we create our own solution? You know that uh, there is a lot of commercial solutions uh, outside. For instance, Innocentive, uh, only to name one, but there are so many. Um, but uh, some of these commercial providers are only applicable for very special solutions. Those of you who worked, for instance, with Innocentive, I think know what I mean. So uh, if you want uh, to get it very targeted, you need a tailor-made platform. That's why we decided. Um, our approach is to have a trusted network. Of course, lots of partners who give um, knowledge into your organization they fear that you um, somehow steal their intellectual property and so you have to ensure that there are no IP activities and we are very strict on this. And um, through our openness we hope that uh, external partners better understand our needs. <coughs> it's not um, of getting uh, into closer contact with those partners where we already have a very close contact. For them um, Pearl Finder might not be the right solution because we already talk on a nearly day-to-day -day basis. But uh, especially for those partners which are a little bit more far away in, in India, in China, wherever, there are so many um, knowledge partners, uh, this platform uh, might help. Uh, we have three key elements of uh, Pearl Finder, or you can call it three briefing types. The first one is an open briefing. Everybody can look into it and we post their non-confidential search fields. For instance, we are looking for new preservatives. Everybody looks for new preservatives. This is not a secret. Um, technology briefings, these are more special uh, ideas where we put more know-how into it and we don't want everybody to know what we are working on. Uh, typically, uh, we select partners where we think they have special expertise and uh, this could be more than 10 partners. And then we have so-called engineering races where we also work with selected partners, typically only two to three. Uh, and we have a request for very special solutions. For instance, <coughs> a product with very special attributes and we tell uh, those partners you are in a race now and you are competing against two or three others which we do not disclose but they know that they are in a tough competition. So uh, let me close my talk about open innovation uh, with our um, connections to the point of sale. I think I don't have to underline here the importance of the point of sale it's the emotional uh, encounter with the brand and uh, as we know from a lot of consumers 
that they need more orientation and advice at the point of sale because there are so many products uh, the shelves are getting big and bigger and you have so many products some of them like Nivea in a very uh, discreet color code so they need advice so what we did is founding uh, the Nivea houses we have now Nivea houses in Berlin Hamburg and Dubai what we do is direct selling of products but we also offer wellness and beauty treatments uh, for consumers and this is a way how we can um, get into deeper touch with consumers and learn uh, about their needs especially uh, if you talk about uh, wellness and beauty and how they apply products and how they want to have applied products by experts. What we also do is um, scientific uh, consumer advice. We yesterday had the presentation from Philips also talking about a way how to investigate a skin and how to explain it to consumer and uh, to uh, utilize it for consumer advice. And what we also uh, do by this is getting into an intensive dialogue, taking uh, skin uh, measurements and give them uh, advice and recommendation for special products but we also uh, evaluate data of the consumers and collect it for our scientific work of course um, we ask them if they allow us to do what we do there here an example uh, from an um, Nivea measurement point uh, which we have in the Nivea houses and in shop in shops uh, at uh, some retailers. Uh, we measure moisture, elasticity, lipids. We give recommendation for sun protection uh, depending on the skin type. We also had uh, experiments with uh, hair measurements. And uh, important to mention is we will not use it for um, skin history uh, I think Philips called it yesterday skin history so we won't measure uh, at day zero and four weeks later because it is very important to control such measurements especially if you measure moisture of skin what you can see here is a computer-aided product advice on a userine fair so here on the screen uh, you can see uh, the picture of a lady and this is a uh, computer program which is able to simulate age. So you can uh, see your picture on the screen and uh, the computer program uh, works out how you look 30 years later. Uh, this, is, uh, yeah, this is shocking uh, for some people. You see then all the uh, freckles, you see uh, dark spots, so you see the wrinkles and you see how you will look when you are 60 or 70 and um, but this shock is uh, somehow helpful to get into a deeper dialogue with the consumer because uh, I heard from everybody not uh, only yesterday but all the time how difficult it is to educate consumers you can market your products but you cannot really educate but showing such pictures and getting into dialogue, it helps to educate. So that's it. Um, there are some take home messages. Um, a healthy open innovation culture is a prerequisite for a running strategy. Let me uh, uh, give you a citation of Peter Drucker who said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you don't have the right innovation culture, forget about your strategy. It takes sometimes 10, 15 years to uh, introduce the right culture and you have to work every day on it. And if a new board member comes in and writes some headlines and says this is a new strategy, it won't work. Uh, creative integration of external know-how is a key influencing factor. Somebody yesterday said uh, we have to get all these smart minds uh, into our knowledge network within the company. Uh, I can only underline this. Uh, and open innovation does not only mean product innovation. You have to, um, to spread the open innovation 
thinking across the whole value chain, including, for instance, point of sale. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. Uh, you've done a, a real good job. It was a very inspiring um, presentation, I think. Um, there is one thing you didn't do well. You didn't catch up with the time. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. But for the rest, it was great. So I, su I suggest we, we just uh, take maybe one question fr from the audience. And then maybe if you have other questions, you, you, you may talk directly to, to Ralph uh, during break or lunch time. So we take one question. Yeah, Sébastien Gourdon from uh, Special Chem. Um, why did you set up this uh, Pearl Finder platform? What was the initial input to, uh, to do that? Um, we thought that it is a good idea to be a better magnet for um, those who have ideas. Uh, there are a lot of companies outside in the world um, and it's somehow sometimes difficult to find them. Uh, and we thought uh, if we have a web platform and if we market the web platform with our company name and with our brand names, and that's where we are working on, then we can attract some partners which we never would find uh, if we don't seek. And the other way, uh, coming to these um, engineering races where we only have two or three partners working for us, it's a good way of managing this race. Of course, you can do it by paperwork and by telephoning, and of course, you have to do this, but it is a good uh, surrounding for having a fair race.